Hi, I'm David Spencer. Welcome to Gardening with Bugs. This video segment is strictly going to be about growing brassicas and the bugs that will accompany it. It's April here at Full Circle Farm and I've got last year's kale right behind me. And what I want to do first of all is just talk about um, just some general guidelines for growing all of the brassicas in which kale is included. So if you're not familiar with, with that term, some people call them coal crops. Uh, we're talking about broccoli, uh, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, uh, all the kale species, all of those ones that are kind of related. And yes, um, also related are, are things like turnips or rutabagas and the mustard family, although um, those are kind of branched off, um, but they have some sim similar characteristics. So first of all, these guys are about to flower and that's important to note. So the, this is a long season crop. It's nice. I can harvest kale in particular all, all season. Um, even now I can still pull off the leaves and they're quite sweet. I can even eat the flowers. It's just like broccoli. Um, but what's happened with these crops is they've gone through the winter and as soon as it warms up again, they believe it's time to flower. So if you're starting new seedlings and those seedlings freeze, they're going to want to bolt like this as well. So it's important to start brassicas right around now. I think I did mine uh, two weeks ago. Um, so I've started them indoors because they're around 20 degrees Celsius, just in a normal like um, starting soil. And then I'll put them out in the cold frame and that should be good enough. They do like it cold. Again, hot temperature can kind of stress them. So the germination temperature is key, obviously, to get them going, but then you might as well move them out and start getting them used to the, used to the temperature. And if you do that this time of year, kale you'll have all season um, the the ones that you want to flower so brus um so broccoli and cauliflower those ones are are usually based on on time from planting them really or time of season so you can get two crops if you put them in now you'll see you'll see the flowers develop sort of early summer and then if you sow them again at the end of the summer you don't really want to be growing them right in the summer because it's too hot but at the end of the summer you can start them again in a similar way that you would have done in the spring in order to get those those flowering heads ready again in the in the fall um, and the winter now brussels sprouts are a bit different in theory you do the same but i actually plant them this time of year and have them right through the winter as well the summer can stress them but um, I d it just hasn't been a problem for me so if I needed to, I could sow them again as well. This is our kale. And this is our baby kale. Thank like you. But let's talk about the pests. So here, first of all, you need to remember that you're growing food. Um, it's food for you, but not everything in the yard knows that. So you're, you are going to get past. And so the first thing is have a bit more tolerance because you are sharing this with, with everything out here. And this in particular is very nutritious and <laughs> nature knows that. And so they want a piece of it. Um, but there's a couple of pests in particular that are, that are really um, damaging for a backyard, but also have a commercial um, value, uh, damage value anyways. Um, and that is in particular the, the cabbage butterfly, that white one, the purist, I think I believe it's called. Um, it's introduced and when it was introduced in the 80s or something like that, when it really became a problem here, they, they tried to bring in its natural parasitoid. Um, and there's a bit of a balance, but it still becomes quite a problem. Now the moth or the butterfly, the adult that you see is not the problem. It's when it lays its eggs and those eggs hatch into larvae or caterpillars that they do quite a bit of damage. And their damage is literally taking bites out of it. So kale, I don't mind sharing a kale that's been eaten on. Um, there's this, tons of research about how plants react to that kind of damage. And in some cases they, they, can, um, they can produce more calcium, a kind of a calcium, um, almost like a neuron system, which alerts the rest of the plant that uh, it's under attack and it can kind of reduce the sweetness or kind of increase its bittering compounds or whatever it's for natural pest defense is. So I, I mean, ideally you do want like the freshest, most perfect growth that's going to taste the best. It'll sell the, the best if that's what you're after, but that's not particularly realistic. 
Um, when it comes to things like cabbages or, or Brussels sprouts, that's when they bore inside of it, they make a hole that some people just won't eat that. Um, usually I'll just cut it. If there's nothing in that hole, then I'll eat it. But those are sort of two, two things that, um, that you'll notice. So traditionally how to get rid of these guys is simply to exclude them with some sort of row cover because the adults have to come in and lay their eggs. Now, if you've rotated your crops, which you especially should do with these because there are root pests as well associated with them and they're heavy feeders. So you do want to rotate beds just to give them a better chance. Um, if that's the case, then all you have to do is exclude those adults. If the eggs are never laid, you'll never have the caterpillars. Uh, I don't do that. And um, I would maybe if I was doing uh, big rows and definitely for, for commercial sale. Uh, but again, I, I'm comfortable sharing a bit. And I know that wasps in particular, especially this time of year, even the ones that sting us, and remember the ones that sting us are only a small proportion of, of the wasps that are around, but they are predators of caterpillars in particular, and tons of things are predators of the, of the larva just when they hatch. So again, that's just another element of food. You're never gonna have the, the cabbage moth and caterpillars wipe out a crop early on, at least not in my, in my climate. It tends to happen later on. Um, when all the other predators and stuff are in a bit of balance. So I'm okay with just leaving it as is. So in a natural garden with lots of like bush around and evergreens and you've, you've done a good job of keeping it as, as organic as possible, um, not just getting rid of wasp nests because you don't like them, because nobody does, um, then you, sh you should be okay with those guys. That being said, if you are growing this plant in an unhappy way, it's going to be stressed out and attract more predators. So things to watch out for, especially if you find a lot of pest pressure on, on a brassica, is first of all, is it, is it the right time of year to be planting it? Maybe you put it out too early and it's a bit uh, stressed and so it's suddenly attracted aphids or something like that. Um, but usually what the case is, is people have their soil a little bit too acidic and these guys like it alkali for sure. So in the summertime, especially with drought comes, if you've got acidic soil, you will see cabbage aphids attack this one. Uh, you'll also see a lot of the, the biting, chewing insects come as well. So be mindful that, you know, an explosion of pests is, is not a sign of necessarily the pest itself being bad. It's a, it's a sign that the pest is, the plant is struggling. So the aphids is the other one I want to bring up. Um, there's several aphids that'll attack brassicas. Um, there's this red green peach one that I get uh, actually usually in the spring. Um, and it's a problem, but I never do anything with it because the natural parasitoids usually wipe it out. And then uh, if they haven't, then the, uh, the native hoverflies end it, uh, usually end it. Um, it's a bit early for, the, for all the butterfly or the um, ladybug species, so they kind of come a little bit later. But it's the cabbage aphid that I want to draw your attention to. And the cabbage aphid is this one that you'll notice it's, it's usually gray. It's in a cluster. And if you see, sometimes when you sneak up on it um, or stand, wave your hand next to it, you'll see the whole thing kind of move in a line, I, like doing the Mexican wave. And that throughout nature, that's an example of a whole bunch of, of individuals uh, doing a single behavior in order usually to ward off a predator by making it look like a large organism moving in that kind of synchronized way. Um, and that's an important defense for them because you'll notice that like in particular our native ladybugs they don't go after these guys as well as they should they lay their eggs further away from them the adults kind of walk in from the edges and pick them off and that to me means like I, I doubt that they're actually it's that population thing that's scaring them off it could also be uh, a scent or some other defense mechanism regardless the predators for those guys are are fewer and far between or just have less of an effect but you also don't necessarily need to do anything with those guys either. Because what you'll tend to find, and this is like with most people I talk about, this is, this is the case. They tend to get it on one plant. So if one plant, whether it's a Brussels or broccoli or a kale, will suddenly get, or, or mustards, will get this uh, cabbage aphid in a huge, huge pile. And usually the, everyone's gut instinct is, is remove that plant or hose that plant down. Now, what I want to suggest is just leave it. Um, it can only spread to other brassicas, so it's not going to like destroy your yard, but you do have to be mindful of where it goes. But by leaving it there, it will attract more aphids to that plant. Uh, that's where they'll spread. They don't tend to spread off as quickly to neighboring plants until whatever's stressing that individual plant has started to stress the ones adjacent to it. So again, you do have to be worried about drought in the summertime, um, potentially over, over watering, although I've never seen that with these guys. Um, fertilizer. 
And remember, if you over fertilize, if you are putting a liquid fertilizer in here, you will get aphids because you're pumping nitrogen, more nitrogen than it wants into its into its vascular system the sucking insects like it so be mindful you need nutritious soil but you don't necessarily need liquid fertilizer oh kale more beef kale but back to the back to the aphid if you if you wash them off same thing they're going to crawl over to the adjacent plants and just feed because they have to be kind of constantly feeding in order to reproduce so the important things to do with these guys is if you're if you're really struggling um, it's past your threshold of course you can cut off some of the leaves you can just mush them with your hand i know most people don't do that for some reason they don't they don't like the thought of of killing all those things uh, with their hands but they're willing to spray it with all sorts of chemicals um, you can do that, but you have to also make sure that they're not already being parasitized because as soon as they're being parasitized, then you want to leave them there because the predators will always win out. Um, the parasitism will, will increase. Everyone that hatches will then parasitize um, exponentially more until you kind of get control. And it seems that once that population reaches, reaches a low or a, a sparsity, that's when the predators like the ladybugs come in and clean it up. So those are really two pests that you that you need to be mindful of. Of course, the root pests and grubs and stuff like that. Again, it's a nutritious plant, so the roots are as well. That's easily solved with with the beneficial insect Stratiolelaps schematis. We just call it Stratio, so it's a tiny little mite that goes in the soil, eats all sorts of like fungus, gnats, and thrips uh, primarily, but also grubs in in all sorts of stages. So these do attract things like um, flea beetle. Um, and, and other ones that lay their eggs and have sort of that vulnerable larval stage in the soil. And that's where the, the soil predator is going to take charge. Otherwise, if, you, if you're really having an aphid problem, the Aphidolides aphidomyza, it, it will eat most species of aphids, so you could release that. But what you will find again with that predator, you will not find it in the highest density on your cabbage aphid if you have other aphids in your, in your yard. And again, I don't really know why. Um, it might just be like a chemical pheromone. Uh, you, what you will see is the brown lacewing, Micromus variegatus. You'll see it kind of naturally showing up on some of them or your native like green, green lacewings as well. So you do have a couple options there, but honestly outside I would never recommend buying um, an aphid predator specifically for one plant. I would just release a little bit at the beginning of the spring um, and then know that it's going to be there for, for whatever aphids pop up wherever in your garden. So brassicas with bugs, um, really if, you, if there's any takeaway from this, it's that um, you need to be mindful of how you're growing the plants. If they are stressed, they're going to get more pests, but you're always going to get pests no matter what. So increase your threshold, your tolerance for them. Be okay to eat a leafy green with a bite out of it. Um, if you're going to do things like sell it at the roadside stand or you are a commercial grower yourself, then obviously your threshold has to be smaller. You're not going to sell those, at least not for the same price. Um, so you, do, you maybe want to invest in row covers, crop rotation, um, and, and definitely do your soil chemistry and make sure that you're growing a bit more alkali um, in very nutrient rich and nutrient rich meaning like compost rich soil. Um, when I start these guys, um, I, can, I can start them in a pretty heavy, heavily fed, um, like heavy compost soil and the, and the seeds sprout and right away they're kind of good, which you'll find is sort of different from like lettuce and spinaches, which tend to do better in, in really uh, lean soil. Um, of course, they will need some nutrients later on, but the seed germination, they seem to prefer that. So definitely check out those two things. Um, supplemental, if you're going to buy predatory insects uh, on a commercial scale with a large farm absolutely that's something you should invest in for most of you as a home growers just be patient watch it monitor for the predators um, if you're not sure what's a predator and what's a pest it's really easy when it comes to aphids if there's aphids there and anything else that anything else is probably a predator okay thanks again for watching uh, stay tuned for the next this is our garden.